Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the member for Stone, Mr. Bill Cash. Thank you very much, uh, Barry, for that. And uh, also, just as a personal anecdote, as I crossed Albert Square, I passed the statue of John Bright, my great-grandfather's cousin, Member of Parliament for Manchester, the man who pushed Israeli into the Reform Act of 1867 and gave the vote to the working class. That one event created modern British Westminster democracy. What could be more important than that today? It is about our ability to choose in general elections, to choose the government that we want in the secrecy of the polling booth by a secret ballot. That is what people have fought and died for. What greater example of national interest could there be than for us to fight and fight again? to save our Westminster democracy. That is what people fought and died for in the last two world wars. It's not just about Europe. It's also about a range of other matters. All the questions of taxation, public expenditure, the whole question, therefore, of health, of education, of the National Health Service, and also, of course, immigration. But in order to be able to untangle that web, which we have now suffered under since Maastricht, and the European Communities Act itself, we have to have a majority in the House of Commons. Please, can I repeat? we have to have a majority in the House of Commons. It's not just a matter of opinions, it's a matter of a majority in the House of Commons. This, therefore, is a matter of extreme national interest. More important, I would argue, than, for example, the speech of Ed Miliband last week, competent performance in terms of delivery, but not a mention of that issue which determines so much of what we are suffering under today, the damage to our political and to our economic system. You see, freedom is not just an abstract, it's actually a necessity. The freedom to choose in the ballot box is a freedom of choice. That freedom of choice in the marketplace of economics or in the marketplace of the ballot box is the most precious thing that we have. And it is not just in the United Kingdom that it matters. It matters across the world and it matters in Europe as well. That is why I led the rebellion against the Maastricht Treaty and voted 47 times against a three-line whip on that. And I'm glad to be able to say that having promoted the Maastricht referendum campaign where we got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of petitions into Parliament, David Cameron the other day said there should have been, yes, there should have been a referendum on Maastricht. And here we are still, in many respects, in a worse position than we were then. So that is what this question is about. It's the freedom to govern. It's the freedom to make that freedom of choice. It is the freedom to vote in the ballot box. This is what is going to be at stake in the 2015 general election. And just as an aside, may I just mention that some may have recalled that 2015 will be just 200 years after the Battle of Waterloo. Of course, by Brussels. Where else? Where Britain stood against 
the vaunting ambitions, the vaunting European, European ambitions of Napoleon. And 2015 will also be the 70th anniversary of our victory over Hitler's own European ambitions in 1945 when we won the war. So what is it that we should be seeking? In order to unravel this enormous network of oppression, as I would put it, in terms of our ability to maintain our democracy, what with majority voting, co-decision, one treaty after another, it seems to me that the most important thing is to have a fundamental change in our relationship. Not just nibbling at the treaties, but a fundamental change. And I have said this repeatedly in the House of Commons. Indeed, I said it at this time last year at the party conference. Certainly to have a referendum and the referendum bill, which I helped to draft, which is now before the House of Commons, will have its report stage, that is it's nearly its final stages in the House of Commons, on the 8th of November. This is a means to our being able to achieve our objectives and it must be held sooner rather than later. I personally believe it should be held before the general election. The referendum itself should be held before the general election, as I said at last year's party conference. But at least we have a referendum, which a year ago wasn't even on the agenda. So, it is well said, my enemy's enemy is my friend. But if my enemy is the integration of Europe, and judging from what Mr. Barroso said in his blueprint speech, and it is also the undermining of our Westminster democracy, then if the Conservative Party is representative of the national interest, which I believe it is, in terms of, for example, what Disraeli said, the Tory party is a national party or it is nothing, then what, I say, of UKIP. They should be our friend, if my enemy's enemy is my friend. But what if their tactics and their strategy will actually defeat not only our own view in the Conservative Party and nationally of the national interest, but the United Kingdom Independence Party's view as well? That is the real question for UKIP. Are you serving the national interest or are you undermining it? I'm glad indeed to debate with Nigel and with Peter. I have never regarded UKIP as fruitcakes or loonies. Indeed, some will, some will recall that I was called much the same by my party leadership in years gone by. It was the same during Maastricht and indeed, I don't know whether Nigel knows this, but the very phrase, the Anti-Federalist League, from which UKIP sprang, was based upon the anti Corn Law League, and Alan Scale and I had a discussion about this in the London School of Economics in the late 1980s or early 90s. And of course, I was also deeply associated with the Bruges Group itself by setting up the Friends of Bruges Group, which laid the seeds of the Maastricht Rebellion. For all these reasons, I believe that we are at a critical phase as we run into the next general election. And yes, I am going to pay tribute to the fact that we have a referendum bill which is supported by the government and it is making progress in the House of Commons. Yes, David Cameron did veto that treaty and it is completely wrong to suggest he did not. And in the Bloomberg speech, the fourth principle, which is that our democracy depends upon the national parliament at Westminster. That was the fourth principle of the Bloomberg speech, and he was completely right about that too. But has the party gone far enough? I don't believe it has gone far enough yet, and nor has it moved soon enough yet. Nibbling at the treaties will not do the job. This is about the fundamental change between ourselves 
and the European Union. And the answer to the question in the referendum bill on the basis of in or out is the right question. Furthermore, we now have the German elections. The German elections have put Angela Merkel in an incredibly strong position. And I ask you to remember that when you are dealing with questions of how the legislation is made affecting all policies, almost every policy in the United Kingdom, the voters are affected by all those policies, health, education, the whole lot. They depend on the economy. And the fact is that what's happening at the moment is that we're running the most monumental trade deficit with the other 27, 28 member states. Indeed, it was a deficit of 47 billion in 2010. By the end of last year, it had risen to a deficit of 72 billion. This is unsustainable. So we have to deal with the question of majority voting because those countries who are dependent economically and politically upon Germany will vote with her. There is no question about that. Look at what is going on all over Europe. Riots, unemployment, rise of the far right. All these things are happening and it is the compression chamber of the European Union which I predicted when I wrote a book against the federal Europe in 1990, which has actually come to pass. So we have some track record, and we can confidently say that at that time, those of us who were in that rebellion got it right. So we have to reaffirm Westminster supremacy. We have to re-engage with the veto, and we have to learn to disapply European legislation where it is not in our national interests. I assume that Nigel would agree with most of that. The next question is how to achieve this and what are the relative roles of the Conservative Party and UKIP in all this? Are we enemies or are we allies? And if not enemies, then what kind of allies? What are our respective objectives, tactics, strategy? Certainly, we have a certain amount in common. We are agreed to a very great extent on many of the European issues and on the resistance to European integration. But above all, our common enemy is that EU integration. And it is the undermining of our Westminster democracy and the necessity to maintain the freedom in the ballot box which I referred to earlier. The European integration is rushing further and further and faster and faster towards us. It is a vast incoming tide. And I have to say that a German-dominated Europe with Angela Merkel at its head is committed, politically committed, to a federal system. There is no doubt about that. That is entrenched in the CDU. That is entrenched in the European People's Party. And again, I have to say, David Cameron did ensure, as I argued when I was Shadow Attorney General, that we should withdraw from the European People's Party because of that very question. And it does have a vast impact on our own economy. So let us not only remember the fourth principle of Bloomberg and the national parliaments in Westminster, and also the veto of the treaty and the referendum bill. This is not in itself a small matter but it is not yet enough. But it was Conservative MPs, if I may say, not UKIP, who turned the tide on the question of the referendum. 80 of us went through the lobbies against the three-line whip and said we will have a referendum and that is what we got. It was Conservative MPs in Westminster who did this. And in relation to the war in Syria, it was 61 Conservative MPs who ensured that that did not take place. Those are facts, not speculation. As Nigel said himself on the 13th of September, he referred to the fact that mercifully, the British Parliament still had the power to be able to say no to the Syrian engagement. He referred to the famous expression though he didn't attribute it to him, of John Bright, who will have stood here on this very platform 
when he coined the phrase, England is the mother of parliaments. That is what Nigel referred to. But it was on this very platform that John Bright stood, as indeed his statue is outside there today. So where are we now? Yes, the European elections are important, but they pale into insignificance given the fact that the European Communities Act is a voluntary act which has been entered into in 1972, I would say largely on false pretenses about the veto, which gave the ability of the European Union to impose those laws upon the United Kingdom. And it remains, it remains that today. It is a voluntary act. We can amend or repeal it. We can disapply legislation if we want to. And my European Scrutiny Committee has been investigating this and most, if not all, the academics agree that that is the case. But it's not just about academics. This is about political will. Now, in the opinion polls which came out yesterday, it appears that UKIP have moved to 13%. I did the calculation in the light of this oncoming speech, this meeting today, at 11%. Just before I go into what impact that will have on our marginal seats, let me just put this point to you. In the last general election, I think I'm right in saying that UKIP had something of the order of 3% before they went into the general election. The result of that was, through their intervention, that there were 23 seats, one might say, in general terms, which we were not able to win in the marginals. That meant we did not have an overall majority. So if one ex looks at 13%, quite clearly there are many, many more marginal seats which can be lost. That is what worries me because it is the national interest which is my main concern. And if by getting that number of votes, they deprive us in those marginals, it may be as many as 60 marginals that could go as a result of their intervention. Now, if they have the same attitudes to us on Europe, if they generally do believe in the national interest in the way in which I have expressed it and which cannot be denied, then what is in the national interest in ensuring that those parties, the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party, who together would refuse us a referendum to all intents and purposes and would stop the process of real fundamental change and renegotiation what interest is it to us to find that we are opposed by the very people who, if they were able to work with us, would then be able to deliver the votes that would enable us to be able to save our Westminster democracy and all that I have already explained. Under a Lib Lab government, there will be no referendum, there will be no renegotiation, there will be no leaving of the treaties, which Nigel and I have both argued for. There will be no national interest. The national interest will go down. That is my charge. That is my challenge. And indeed, it has been calculated this week that for UKIP to actually be able to get as many as one member of parliament, they'll need to have 20% of the vote in the general election. Now, I asked Nigel, is that going to happen? I doubt it. He'll say if it will. And the reality is, oh no, the reality is that you have to have a majority in the House of Commons in order to get one fraction of what it is that we need in terms of repealing or amending or disapplying European legislation. Let us be realistic. That is what I am saying, and I hope Nigel is listening. Today, in the Times, he talks about a joint ticket. Now, irrespective of whether or not the party leadership is interested in a joint ticket or not, I have to say, UKIP has stood against me in every general election that I can remember where they've been in the position to do so. 
doesn't seem to have made very much difference. My majority has gone up from 3,000 to 14,000. But having said that, what I do say is that if he argues that the Conservatives and UKIP should be on a joint ticket and it's not going to be accepted, there is a simple option. And that is that because they will not have this majority, which is so necessary, they must ensure that we are in a position to deliver the national interests that they claim they have in common with us. Westminster democracy, no European integration, leaving the existing treaties. Now, on that kind of basis, I simply say to him, are we going to be enemies or are we going to be allies? Are we going to support the national interest? And if they do not stand in those marginal seats which will make all the difference, they will prove their point that they are acting in the national interest because it is the Conservative Party which has the capacity to deliver that majority in the House of Commons which is so absolutely vital to our future national concerns. So it is very simple. This is not rocket science. This doesn't require a mathematical genius. It is very simply that on the basis of a very determined and if I may say, from his point of view, a successful campaign, I'm not going to detract from that. From his point of view, that's fine. But is it in our national interest? I say to change our policies, to get rid of European integration, to enable us to be able, as I argued even in Maastricht, to get rid of European government, to give back the power to the British people to be able to decide in that polling booth, in that secret ballot, the kind of government they want for which people fought and died. That is something worth fighting for. That is the national interest. That is why I say to Nigel, lay off our marginal seats. Don't just try and go for uh, a joint ticket. It won't work. But if you do it, you will then be allies and not our enemies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for that impassioned plea. Now, our next speaker knows, needs no introduction from me. He is indeed the man that the leaders of the other national parties will not debate with. He's the man that threatens to break the cosy consensus that they have between each other. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party, Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you. Well, Barry, thank you. And uh, I must say, it's very good to be here um, and to feel so welcome in Manchester from all sides. Uh, the fact that I was, you know, taken off the official program and barred entry to the secure area, uh, despite the fact that politicians and, and lobbyists from all over the world, of whatever political hue, have been welcomed in, doesn't worry me. I've been thrown out of far worse places than the Tory conference in Manchester. And I, I come along to a Bruges group as somebody who is not a fraud. I've been a member of this organisation for 25 years. Um, and I've done my best during those 25 years uh, to come along to the meetings and sit in the audiences and listen to people like Bill Cash speak. Um, and I've tended over those years to have the utmost respect, particularly at the time of Maastricht, for what those rebels tried to do. But I have to say, Bill, I'm sorry to say this, but listening to you this afternoon, I've realized that you are a hopelessly out of date tribal politician who has not recognized that British politics has fundamentally changed. And to ask me 
to ask me to ask me to support a party led by Mr Cameron in order that we can get back our national independence, I'm sorry, you've got to do rather better than that. You really have. And I mean, don't forget, Bill, that at exactly this time last year, at the last Tory party conference, the official Cameron position, which was argued with great passion, is that he did not want there to be a referendum on our membership of the European Union. He said it five times publicly. Five times he said it because he said, I believe we must remain members of the European Union. Now we come to this conference with Mr Cameron promising a distant referendum. This of course from the same man who not so long ago gave us a cast iron guarantee that if he became Prime Minister there'd be a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty and then of course he let us down like a cheap pair of braces. This one comes after he gets a majority and after a renegotiation and is nothing more than an attempt to kick the issue into the long grass for the course of the next four years. But the real question, Bill, is why is there a referendum promise this year? Is it because of the Tory Eurosceptic backbenchers? Yes. Is he really frightened of them? Well, Bill, you said earlier that you voted 47 times against the Maastricht Treaty. True. But there's one thing you forgot to tell this audience, Go on. that you voted for the Maastricht Treaty by supporting John Major in the motion of confidence debate. When it came to the ultimate test, very you failed simple. the test. Very you simple. failed the test. Very you simple, put your party Michael. before yeah, no, this country. No. That would have led to John Smith taking over. Now ah, you see, it. now poor old Bill says, that would have left to John Smith taking over. Tribal politics. Some sort of pretense there's now a difference between the Labour and the Conservative parties. When actually what we've done, actually what we've done is given away the ability to govern our own country. I spent 20 years before getting involved in politics working in the City of London, working in the private sector. I worked damned hard up until lunchtime every single day that I was there. Uh, but I can tell you that Britain's, you Britain's biggest industry, Bill, Britain's biggest industry, 10% of our GDP, and it now doesn't matter whether we have David Cameron in Downing Street or Ed Miliband in Downing Street, because in November 2010, since your great leader became Prime Minister, and on a three-line whip, British Conservative MEPs voted to transfer control of Britain's biggest industry to a French bureaucrat who wishes us no good and three new European regulatory authorities. I'm sorry, Bill, the world has moved on and the best way to change British politics is from without and not from within. Now, now my job is to come to this Conservative conference and to say to Conservative delegates uh, that in many ways I think we could have common cause. Not with these tired arguments about tribal politics, but let's talk about the next election. The next election takes place on May the 22nd next year. A fact that is almost completely forgotten with all the media speculation about the next general election. And I've got a suggestion to all the Tory delegates that are here in Manchester this week and who genuinely care about regaining British independence, which, a point on which Bill and I do sincerely and wholeheartedly agree. I put it to you, Bill, that if you want British independence, you have got to vote UKIP on May the 22nd next year. And there are two. And there, are two very, and there are two very good reasons. There are two very good reasons why Tories like you, Bill, should vote UKIP on May the 22nd next year. The first is that what it will do is it will up the ante. It will keep the pressure up for there being a referendum at some point in time. Given that your leader lied before, you know, holding his feet to the fire would be no bad thing. I also think that a big UKIP success next year will of course also force the Labour Party into promising a referendum too. 
something that will happen, but I think in many ways, the sooner the better. And there's another reason, I think, why in the end many Conservatives, perhaps even Mr Cameron himself, may thank me for urging Tories to vote for UKIP on May the 22nd next year. And it's this. If we have an earthquake through Westminster politics, those tremors and reverberations will be felt in Brussels. If our friends, in inverted commas, in Brussels, I'm thinking of Mr Barroso, Van Rompuy, and other such luminaries and household names, if they realise that we are absolutely deadly serious, then there's a good chance that your leader may even get some better renegotiated terms. There may be some concessions offered by Merkel or anybody else. We may even have a better debate about Britain's relationship with the Union. So I think for all of those reasons, uh, Conservatives should vote UKIP on May the 22nd next year. And I've every reason to believe that actually in increasingly large numbers they would. And they will. But the real speculation, it would appear from my visit, my unwanted in some ways visit to Manchester, is this great speculation over deals at the next general election. I spent this morning in Salford, in a solid Labour ward of Salford, somewhere the Labour Party have held for a hundred years, somewhere, Bill, where with the best will in the world, you'll be wasting your time going out and knocking on doors. The Tories have never won that ward. The Tories are never going to win that ward. But I tell you something, having never stood in that ward before, in hard Labour territory, in June, UKIP came second. And in that by-election on October the 10th, I'm not going to make a false prediction, but if we don't win it, we'll run old Labour damned close. And there's a very important point that I think is being missed here. And it's being missed almost deliberately by all of the commentators, particularly the Tory commentators. And it's this, UKIP's appeal, whether it's on the European question, whether it's on mass uh, open door immigration, whether it's on our desire to bring back grammar schools, to give working class kids in poor areas a chance to get on, whether it's on all these issues, actually UKIP connects not just with traditional Tories, it connects across the political spectrum. You know, and I saw what happened at Eastleigh this year when we damn nearly took that seat from the Lib Dems and the Tory press all said, UKIP cost the Tories Eastleigh. But you know, only a third of the votes we got in Eastleigh came from the Conservatives, two thirds came from the Lib Dems, Labour and from non-voters. And the point I'm making is that UKIP is creating, Bill, its own political space. We are not just a subset, a rump of the Tory Eurosceptics who were disappointed that you didn't have the courage in the end to resist Maastricht. We've become far more than that. We are a genuine force in British politics and we're not going to go away. And the idea that somehow there is going to be a deal that goes on between David Cameron and myself and UKIP, well, I think, frankly, the fact that I've been excised from the brochure of fringe meetings here in Manchester tells you just how likely that is. You know, they, regue, they regard us as being members of the lower orders. They must be truly appalled that in the upper reaches of UKIP we have working class people. I mean, this must be the most shocking thing for Cameron to see, it really must. Uh, we are treated... We are treated... We are treated with contempt, and I thought it was terribly funny on the Mar program yesterday. He couldn't bring himself to mention my name or the word UKIP. It's all too difficult. So there isn't going to be a deal uh, between us and the Conservative Party at the next general election. That is impossible. And our voters wouldn't want it. And it would not be in the national interest, frankly, to put Mr Cameron back in office when he believes in continued membership of the European Union. But, but, but I am not a wholly unreasonable person. And, and I do recognise that there are some people on the back benches 
in the Conservative Party, and indeed there are some in the Labour Party too, who feel as UKIP feel on most of these key issues. And I think Peter Bone, who's sitting here, and indeed Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, and Nadine Dorries too, have made the running with the idea that why can't we have, perhaps in some areas, a cooperation that takes place at local level between UKIP associations and Tory or perhaps even Labour local associations. And my attitude is, you know, we run our, our party on a very autonomous basis and if conversations take place at local level with sitting members of Parliament who want the support of the local UKIP branch and intend to run on a joint ticket, I am open-minded to that because it seems to me getting those MPs back into Westminster probably would be in the national interest and something where UKIP would be prepared to work with you. So I'm utterly sincere in wanting to see the good people get back to Westminster, but it's not going to happen, Bill, with us just standing aside. Don't think UKIP is a here today, gone tomorrow political party. It is not. It is a far stronger phenomenon than that. It is not going to go away. It is not going to go away. Well, Bill, I tell you, when you shout at me and ask me, how am I going to repeal the 1972 European Communities Act? When pushed to the test, I would not vote for the Maastricht Treaty to support my Prime Minister. I show a bit more guts than that. Simple as that. I'm sorry, Bill. You had your moment in history. You didn't have the courage to do what was right. You didn't, frankly, have the balls to put country before party. And I'm sorry for that. And that's why UKIP exists. If you'd done it, if you'd gone against the motion of confidence, if you'd stopped the Maastricht Treaty, I doubt UKIP would ever have needed to come into being. But it's come into being, and it isn't going away. And I repeat the message, ladies and gentlemen, especially those of you that are delegates to this Tory conf conference, take the opportunity on May the 22nd next year. Lend your vote to UKIP in those European elections. Let's cause an earthquake in British politics, one whose tremors will be felt in Brussels and around the rest of the world and do something positive and constructive towards getting back what we want, because what we want is our country back. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our third speaker is one of the finest journalists that we have in our country. Many journalists write well, but many journalists follow the herd. Peter Oborn is at his best when writing an article that goes against the conventional point of view. Peter, we thank you for your independence your integrity and your desire to get to the truth about the great issues of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mr. Peter. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the Bruges Group, which has played such a significant role in our national debate over the last uh, quarter century uh, for allowing me to be on a platform with three of the politicians who I admire most in British politics, each of them truly principled men who have fought for a cause. I, um, I've, I'm, I'm proud to sit alongside them, and even though I might disagree with some of them in, what I, in my words this afternoon, I think they, all, all of them in their different ways have transformed British public debate uh, for the better. Um, and I would also like to recommend the essays of A.J.P. Taylor, who, uh, which I edited for the Bruges Group, wrote an introduction for it, at any rate, for the Bruges Group many years ago. Uh, he was a Mancunian, a free trader. He uh, wrote passionately against the European Union and brilliantly 
in the Sunday Express, and I cannot recommend those essays too much. Um, I, I am going to take uh, issue with Mr. Farage a little later on, but first of all, I want to place uh, the rise of UKIP in a, in a historical context, and I'm trying to go and speak from the perspective of a political journalist, but a sympathetic observer, a conservative political journalist who believes wholeheartedly that the emergence of UKIP and uh, the emergence of Nigel Farage as one of our front rank politicians has been absolutely a force for good in this country. So something went very wrong uh, with uh, British public discourse in the last two decades. It became concentrated on the center ground. It was captured by an elite group of political, an elite political class which referred to its own interests and forgot and were contemptuous of the voters. It was an anti-democratic process. It, it, it saw politics as primarily a matter of technology, of, of, of opinion polls and focus groups. Uh, and it was very contemptuous of str strongly held beliefs, whether of right or of left. The Conservative Party was captured by a group of modernizers who treated the Tory activists with contempt. The Labour Party was captured by a group of modernizers who treated Labour Party activists with contempt. Political debate took, part, took, took place on a tiny center ground. And I was very worried. I wondered what would happen. I wondered, I, it, it was possible to foresee that something would break that mold. And it was something to fear was that it might be a racist party of the far right. And there were indeed signs about five years ago that the BNP might play that role. In fact, it does appear that UKIP, which is not a racist party as I understand, which is a strongly patriotic party, emerged instead. The, the conservative politicians who spoke against UKIP members, it was outrageous. UKIP members, I know many of them, many of decent, patriotic, hardworking people, deeply and profoundly concerned about the future of this nation. Uh, they, it is wonderful that suddenly, out of nowhere, their views are being heard. And boy, did the British political and media establishment try to stop UKIP's views being held, heard. One of the most marvelous things about Nigel Farage is that although we see him a lot now on Question Time, for about 15 years, he went back to old-fashioned politics. I once had, I had dinner with Nigel a few years ago. He'd just come down from some sort of meeting, pounding the pavement in a local elections, I think it was, up in the north. He was just about to he'd come into London briefly. He was then going to catch a train to the West Country and pound the streets again there. Now, this was real, proper politics, door-to-door -door stuff, completely below the radar. The BBC refused to acknowledge the existence of UKIP. Uh, there were uh, European elections about uh, 10 years ago, and I remember looking at the screen, uh, and UKIP, uh, as it happens, had done very well. I think you'd got about 20%. Uh, they said Tories, 30%, Labour, 26%, other, 20%, uh, other, 20%. The BBC was so blind, they couldn't even acknowledge the existence of UKIP. And so UKIP emerged not because it was, uh, 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 came from above, it emerged from below. It is the first, uh, it's often said, and I've read in the press, that it's the most important uh, political party to emerge uh, since the uh, SDP in the early 1980s, which was equally designed to break the mold. I think you're much more important than the SDP for this reason. SDP was a top-down project. It was an elite project designed uh, to use uh, existing political technology and, and, and govern from above. You have come from below, and we must, everybody who loves democracy in this country must be grateful for the work which Nigel Farage has done, which so many other people in this hall have done. 
You have transformed British politics. You've brought an honesty into British political debate. You have refreshed British politics. Nigel Farage, one of a very few number of politicians in this country who is now instantly recognized. Boris Johnson has some of that. George Galloway has some of that. Caroline Lucas of the Greens has some of that. There's very few people of you who are prepared to stand outside the political establishment and tell truths which the political establishment hates to hear. Uh, and I, I, uh, that is why I have always welcomed and been fascinated by the emergence, by the emergence of UKIP. We now come to what your current strategy is and your relationship with the uh, Conservative Party. Uh, and that is the discussion of today's debate. It is a profoundly important discussion which will shape the, the future of Britain for the years, the decade ahead. Uh, and uh, I want to make an argument that UKIP made a mistake six months ago. Uh, six months ago, David Cameron, we, we all have our opinions of Mr. Cameron, called, uh, made a pledge to hold an in-out referendum if he wins the next general election. Now, that is an unequivocal pledge. It will be in the Conservative election manifesto. Mr. Cameron has said that it will take place two years after the next election in 2017. Now, as I understand it, that is exactly what UKIP wanted and had been campaigning for, an in-out referendum. The opportunity for a great national referendum on the greatest, one of the great issues of our time, you'd won. At that point, you had in front of you the opportunity, and still do have the opportunity in front of you, to sit on a platform, definitely here, alongside many, many Conservative MPs, alongside Cabinet Ministers, arguing the case that Britain is better off outside the European Union. It was a fantastic moment, a fantastic, and I, Bill Cash is claiming the credit, rightly so, he's an extraordinarily honorable and courageous man. I give the, more of the credit to UKIP, because UKIP changed the national debate. UKIP terrified the MPs inside the Conservative Party into taking that position. UKIP ultimately terrified Mr. Cameron into pledging that referendum. I think at that point, UKIP had a choice. It could either say, right, that's brilliant. We are now going to go behind the Conservative Party to win the election so that we can campaign wholeheartedly for no after the election. You could then start constructing your no campaign. You could advise your supporters to vote Conservative in the election and then come outside of the election, get the no campaign going, get the education process going, make sure that unlike in 1975, you'll have a fair national debate. Remember, in national, 1975, it was incredibly unfair debate, fixed really by the establishment. Instead of which, you, 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 didn't, you didn't accept the gift. You said, no, we're going to carry on as an independent party. And what you've done is something, I'm watching you again as a com political commentator, very interesting. You're saying, we're going to be actually a political party like all the others. We're not just going to be about that one thing we want, which is out of Europe, which where you, your views are shared by so many British people, where your arguments are so strong. You're now going to be a political party which has views on defense, on health, has policies on every area. Now, I'm just saying this in a friendly way. So far, you've done very badly about that. When you fought the last election, 2010 general election, your sums were candidly a shambles. I think that the uh, your extra 100 billion of spending, you say you want a smaller, smaller state, but you were pledging spending right, left, and center, and cutting taxes at the same time. You were going, there was going to be the most enormous borrowing slurge, which would have made Gordon Brown green with envy. Now, the other point is, and this of course is the much bigger point, is that by fighting the Conservatives when we get to the uh, general election, is that you will almost certainly stop David Cameron winning an outright majority. There's a fascinating poll carried out by Lord Ashcroft 
which showed that the threat to Cameron when we get to the general election, the threat to the Conservatives does not come so much from Labour, who are languishing. It comes from UKIP, who are taking away Conservative voters. And so we will not get, if you carry on with your strategy at the moment, with the enormous and in many ways very deeply deserved success you have, if you carry on like that, you are radically diminishing the chances of a Conservative victory. Well, if you don't get a Conservative victory, can I just say something to you, Mr. Farage? You won't get that in our referendum. It's an incredibly important point. In fact, you're going to get David Miliband, Ed, well, Ed Miliband as, as, I mean, almost as bad. Ed Miliband from your, Ed Miliband as Prime Minister, profoundly pro-European. You are, I hate to say this, the friends of the Euro-Federalists. A UKIP vote is a vote for Euro-Federalism. Now, I, I, um, and I, it breaks my heart because you have fought so well, you've outlined the issues so well, you've changed the nature of our debate, but at the end of the day, you have become the best friend Mr. Barroso ever had. You are the allies of the Euro-Federalists. You are the, the bureaucrats in Brussels' best friend. They will be cheering you on in Brussels. They will really want you to do well. They may even send a delegation of support. You may even get some euro federal funding if you ask for it. Now, uh, you've, uh, the arguments you have said, I've heard you, heard you, I listened to you very carefully. You can't trust Cameron. I don't see how Cameron can get out of this one. I don't see how he can, he's made that pledge. I, I do not think that if Cameron wins the next election, he can avoid, he can avoid, um, he can avoid holding that referendum. By the way, I do think, just en passant, the idea you want the referendum as soon as possible is just wrong. There's an enormous crisis going on in Europe, the Eurozone crisis. We, uh, I, I, at some point it seems to me likely that at least one country will have to fall out of the Eurozone system. Perhaps the whole Eurozone system will collapse altogether. If it doesn't, it looks like we're going to move rapidly to a much more federal Europe than we already have. It's much better to know what kind of Europe we're going to be in or out of. Uh, before we have that debate. It may, we may, may, we may, may well not know in 2017, but we certainly don't know now. We, it's much better to wait till after the, general, after the general election, after time has passed, after we can at least have a decent idea of, about what is the Europe we are going to leave or to stay in. I, um, I, um, I, I feel also, and I think this is the, perhaps the concluding point, that if you maintain those, if you worked with the Conservatives for an in-and-out referendum in a friendly way, you would find when you fought that no campaign, you would find yourself on a platform, on many platforms up and down the country with, I guess, 100 plus Tory MPs. You'd find yourself on platforms alongside Conservative MPs. We do have, by far and away, the most Eurosceptic Tory party we've ever had and once again that's much of that is down to UKIP because of the way in which you have forced the issues right out into the open, the way you have forced the party hierarchies to come to grips with it but at the moment I simply worry that uh, you will not be by your own actions you will prevent yourself from being one of the most powerful brilliant speakers in the No campaign of 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for those comments, Peter. Uh, I'm now going to take a few questions before we close the meeting. Can I see those members that would like to ask a question? Yes, the gentleman there on the gangway. Yes, with the blue... Leaflet. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Troy. 
I'd like to ask the panel, um, once we have had a, a referendum on our future membership of the European Union, how do the panel see as the best way out of the EU? Is, in fact, Article 50 an acceptable route? Thank you. Nigel. A uh, difficult one. You know, I have to say I find the fact Lisbon was pushed through without a referendum that makes it very difficult to accept. But there it is. It's law. So we have to enter into our divorce from the European Union uh, according to the provisions and principles of Article 50. But if we see any shoddy dealing and if we see Article 50 being used as a means of extracting more from us than we should be giving, uh, then we'll have to just throw the whole thing in the bin. So we need, to, we, we need to enter into this divorce with a spirit of doing it legally and doing it amicably, uh, but the European Union and Brussels itself will need uh, to play fair for the bargain too. Nigel, I think a lot of people probably aren't too deeply involved with Article 50. I know. Could, could you just explain the negotiation process well, that would I, happen under Article 50? I think, to be honest, Barry, we can talk about Article 50, but I think, to be honest with you, we're jumping the gun. The important thing in the debate this afternoon, I think, with respect, is how do we get that referendum? Uh, you know, and I've said that without UKIP, it wouldn't be on the agenda, and that a vote for UKIP next May brings it even closer. And two gentlemen have told me that the problem is, at the next general election, if you vote UKIP, and if we get more Tory votes than Labour votes, we'll take that referendum further away, if I can sort of sum up what's been said. Uh, you're all forgetting something, guys. The Labour Party will promise a referendum too at the next general election, as will the Liberal Democrats, as has every single party at every single election since 1997, without themselves ever genuinely wanting to deliver. And the way we will get a referendum is if we get a good number of UKIP MPs in Westminster holding the balance of power, then there'll be a referendum. But it will happen. Bill, do you want to comment on Article 50 at all? Yeah, I mean, very simply, uh, there is only one thing that ultimately matters, and I've explained it in my speech, and that is whether or not you have a majority in the House of Commons to achieve your objectives. If the referendum... Uh, did not happen, then, of course, we would not be in a position to be able to repeal the 1972 Act unless the political parties in question were prepared to do it. But let's get real. Nigel, get real. You cannot do anything to remove the European Communities Act on which the whole of the European fabric and structure depends in the United Kingdom unless you have got a majority in the House of Commons. And even you're not going to say that you would, in UKIP, could even possibly approach that sort of figure. You know it. It's a fact. And it's not that I don't want similar kind of objectives in terms of leaving the existing treaties, disapplying European legislation having a referendum, but for all these things, you have to have a majority in the House of Commons. That is something which isn't a matter, as I said, of, of uh, uh, rocket science, it's just a fact. And if you can't deliver that, as Peter was indicating, uh, and if you were actually to prevent us from being given the, even the opportunity of doing so, then you defeat your own interests. That's the problem. There's so much that we have in common on the European issue. As I said to you at a previous meeting, on those matters, most of them, there isn't a cigarette paper between us. You've used that expression again since we had that debate. And there isn't on those questions. But there is on the fundamental issue, not of the change in the relationship, but on the question of whether or not you can get a majority in order to achieve the but objective. It could, but it could be, Bill, that British politics has changed to the extent that we're not going to see majority governments in the British Parliament and that actually here on, coalition is going to be the norm anyway. Next question, I'll take the gentleman on the side there. Yes. Uh, Brian Sylvester, I'm uh, a councillor for Cheshire East here in the North West. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Nigel, um, does he seriously believe that if there was a referendum in 2017 that Cameron would take us out? I don't think he would, because he would turn around with his, his colleagues in the uh, EU uh, uh, establishment and say that the electorate didn't understand, they had to have a second vote just like they had uh, in, well. in Ireland. And, and actually, uh, in, in Spain this year, uh, Cameron did a, an interview with the Spanish media, which he, he actually stated, I will not take them out even if they voted no. So the only alternative 
it, it's not to vote Conservative, not to vote Labour, but to vote UKIP, because that's the only way you're going to get out of the union. I mean, I, I don't... Um, I don't know. I, I don't trust David Cameron, and what's bizarre is he said if he wins a majority, which he isn't, isn't going to happen anyway, if he wins a majority, he'll enter into a renegotiation stating at the outset of the negotiation that whatever the outcome, he will support a yes vote in the referendum. I mean, that is like throwing the stick away before you walk into the room to get the negotiation. But I will say this, and I, and I will put this back to Bill and to Peter. You know, there is one thing that David Cameron can do in the short term, which will absolutely, electorally, knock out the legs from under UKIP, and it'll pick up Eurosceptic support from elsewhere as well. If Mr. Cameron is bold enough and brave enough to do what I think the vast majority of this country demands, namely to go to Brussels between now and Christmas and to say we simply cannot open the door up unconditionally to the whole of Bulgaria and Romania next year. If, you know, I mean, I have to say, I have to say uh, that if David Cameron did that, uh, that I might rethink completely my attitude towards him, but I don't see any sign of it happening. Peter? It's one of the problems I think you're getting into now, Nigel. Are you in after a, a referendum on Europe? Do you want to be out of Europe? Are you going to back David Cameron if he's changes his policy towards immigrants from, uh, from Bulgaria? I, I think you're... Well, if he defies the treaty, Peter, if he's prepared to say to our partners in Brussels that actually this part of the treaty has turned out rather differently to the way we envisaged it 40 years ago, uh, and that actually we cannot go along with this, uh, then we can share a platform in January, and I might have a very different attitude. But I'm not convinced he's got the will or the belief to do it. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Yes, the gentleman in the, in the glasses, middle of that row. Yeah, Th go on. David Bailey. Uh, I just want to point out that I watched uh, David Cameron um, telling people that before the last election that there would be no reorganisation of the health service and he no sooner got in and there was a reorganisation and that's uh, so, so what he says has got no real uh, value I think anymore. Okay, thanks for that comment. Can I have a question from the other gentleman just at the back there with glasses? The gentleman is standing. Yes, you sir. In the current issue of Eurofacts, there is a report that Mr. Cameron, in an interview with El Pais, a Spanish newspaper, was asked if the British people vote no in a referendum to clear out of the European Union, uh, to clear out of the European Union, would you lead Britain out of the European Union? And he said, no, I will not. So that you're gonna... is the reason why people should vote UKIP, I think, and I'm not a member of any political party. So, Bill, will, will you then Bill. find a leader of the Conservative Party that, that will lead Britain out and first, first all, carry out the will of the people, and who might that be? Well, first of all, um, I'd be very interested, because I haven't actually heard this before. I, I, it's in El Paez, by uh, the newspaper in Spain, apparently. All I can say is that um, if that was something which was uh, well known within the Conservative Party in Parliament, uh, and I shall certainly be making my own inquiries into that, um, then it would have a very... It, yeah, and I, I'm, you're showing me a piece of paper. That's fine, it's fine, fine. I'm not, I'm not disputing what you're saying. I'm simply saying I believe in reading stuff for myself. Thank you. But what I am saying That's is okay. that if David Cameron defied... If David Cameron or any other political leader defied the vote of a of a, which had been authorised by Parliament at a referendum, it would change the whole nature of the relationship between himself and his party. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Bill. Yes, gentlemen, two in, just at the back there, grey suit and a moustache, I think you've got, sir. Back a bit, back a bit, keep going back. I have a question for Mr Farage. Do you personally support your deputy Paul Nuttall's views on the return of an English Parliament? Well, I think we've got to completely readjust our view on the United Kingdom. Uh, I think we have to head towards a federal. Yes, there we are. I've used the F word, uh, but not in the context of Europe. I think a federal future for the United Kingdom, uh, where the English start to get a better deal and feel they've got their own voice, is the only way, long term, we are going to save the Union. Uh, but frankly, having these debates 
about an English parliament, its merits or demerits, even having a referendum in Scotland next year. Quite honestly, these debates are irrelevant if we go on being a country, 75% of whose laws are made by the institutions of the European Union. That's the constitutional question we must sort out first, and then the rest, I believe, will fall into place. Thank you. Can I take the gentleman in the pull over there at the end of the row? Thank you. Yes, you, sir. Somebody going to give this gentleman the microphone? Thank you. Uh, Anthony O'Neill from Stockport. Can the Conservatives win a majority without cons uh, social Conservatives who are flocking to UKIP over such issues as gay marriage? Bill, I think uh, that's a subject you'll have some well, strong views there on. Is, there is, I mean, I voted against uh, same-sex marriage, um, and uh, so did a significant number of other Conservatives in Parliament. And I know it's not popular in the Conservative Party. Um, that is a, a fact. And, um, uh, but it, I don't think that that really is the ultimate question when it comes to the issue which we'll be faced with in the general election about the European issue. It's actually about democracy and it is about whether or not we are able to repeal the European Communities Act and to or amend it and uh, the issues there are matters which have a profound effect upon our economy. We should be trading across the world. We are running a deficit, as I said just now, uh, 47 billion a year and a half ago, now it's nearly double that with the other 28 member states. So that is the issue. I, I, do, I, I don't agree any more than I did when I voted against it with the same-sex marriage bill. And there are other issues. I'm not going to dispute that. But the real question is who governs Britain because who governs Britain decides whether or not matters of legislation, taxation, health, education, all these other things, and also the interference with small businesses of the massive overregulation that we have to endure. On that, Nigel and I, and indeed many other people in the United Kingdom, will be fully agreed. Peter, have you some views on the political climate as regards this, this matter? If, if, um, if, if David Cameron alienates sh sh real conservatives? Well, yeah, again, I, I, I think it takes us back to the lack of clarity about what UKIP is. Is it a campaigning organization to get Britain out of Europe? Or is it sort of a, sort of mass of dis, uh, uh, angry Tories? And I think that it's, no, dan it's no, dangerous. No. And, uh, 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 just going on the gay marriage thing. I, I, I think this week, uh, Mr. Cameron made a very, very important step, which was towards recognizing marriage in the tax system. And funnily enough, I don't think he, he hasn't gone nearly far enough, but it's a major step. It recognizes that principle. I don't think he could have done that without the gay marriage vote. I think it's got. To, I, I think there is something he was saying. He's made a big statement about marriage. I like it. There's, there's, there's a point I think that both Bill and Peter are missing. We're here in Manchester, across Manchester, Newcastle, Sheffield, across these big northern cities. The Conservative Party now, under this leadership, is disappearing in the same way that it did in Scotland. It is literally disappearing. It isn't, just the so it, it isn't just social issues, conservative social issues, it's actually a total disconnect with what we used to call the blue collar vote. And you know, the so-called image of the posh kids in London, there is a complete disconnect up here with the North, and yet, fascinating isn't it, it's in these areas that UKIP is experiencing its biggest electoral gains. We're coming second in by-elections, 25% of the vote in South Shields, where I was this morning in a hard labour area. And, and, and this, I think, is what's interesting and what Peter doesn't understand. You know, he's still stuck with the mindset that we're a group of people who got together because Bill's lot couldn't quite make it, sadly, at Maastricht. We're not that. It's much, much more than that. And it is now a patriotic political party who sees Peter leaving the European Union as turning the key to the door to a land of opportunity where we can actually have a government that stands up for good, ordinary, decent working people. And that's what you get to become. We are the working class party.
Just, just, no, I mean just, uh, Bill? Nigel, just one point. I, I would like to put this to you because uh, you're, you've been pretty extravagant in some of the things you've said. I'm not taking, I'm not going to take a front. I'm not going to take, <laughs> it doesn't worry me what you say, I can tell you. But what I will say is the one question that I'd like you to answer is how many seats do you think at the very best you would be able to win in the next general election? Uh, all through the 90s, I was told UKIP would never get anywhere. No, I want and to answer. Had, uh, and do, then we had, do, do and then we had yes. proportional representation. I was told we hadn't got a chance. We won three seats. In February 2009, I was told we'd be wiped off the electoral map in the European elections of that year. We came second across the United Kingdom. I was told it was a freak. We could never repeat it in a domestic election. And we just got 23% of the vote in the English county elections. The answer is, Bill, if we win the European elections and on the same day hundreds of council seats up and down this country, I don't know, but I think there is a possibility we get enough people in Westminster to hold the balance of power, and I repeat, then there will be a referendum. I think you're living okay. in cloud cuckoo land, Nigel. You've, Bill, but Bill, you've told me I've been living in cloud cuckoo land from the very start of UKIP. No, and we I keep did not. surprising no. you. That, and that's because, that is, we, thank you, that's because we've lost thank faith in the political class much. in this country. That's not what I Let's said. take a final not question. Then. I'll take a question from the lady in the purple scarf. I joined UKIP. But I, I was an ex-Tory. The last election, I fought a marginal seat for David Cameron. Then I was an angry Tory because when people came up, shadow cabinet members came up to me and said, you can't talk about Europe, you can't talk about immigration, you can't talk about your support for grammar schools. And I was a working class Tory. That made me angry. But do you know, I'm really happy now I'm back in UKIP. And if I get the chance to fight the European elections next year in the South East, I really hope every one of you in this, this room vote for us because that's the, gener that, that's the election that you will get because I'm not convinced that Cast Iron Dave will give you a referendum. And there's a question to Peter. Peter, why do you think we're not allowed, actually? We shouldn't have domestic policies. We are the third party in politics now. Forget, forget, forget the Lib Dems. And if we can demonstrate to people that we have, do have views on these issues, then they can vote for us. And we will get into Westminster, and I want to be at Westminster in 2015. Peter? Yeah. Uh, I recognise the importance of those issues, and I recognise that... You know, the Conservative Party doesn't, I think it's exaggerated, I think this, this, the Conservative government has, has done many good things. But I recognise the importance of those issues. I just think that if you have a lack of clarity in your output, in your outlook, you will achieve nothing. While you're focused on that one thing, we'll get a vote on in and out of Europe, that is our objective, you stick to that, you will get an in and out vote in Europe and you'll be able to campaign alongside Bill Cash may be certainly loads of Conservatives uh, on that issue. If you turn yourself into a, 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 a populist anti-Westminster party like the Tea Party, I think you'll, I think you'll do all right. You, you, you won't win a Westminster seat on the current system. You, if, if the House of Lords went PR, you'd flood the House of Lords, full of UKIP peers. <laughs> but, uh, that's, but, but, um, uh, and, but I, but I don't think you'd be nearly as effective. Okay, I'll just take a final wind-up comment from Bill and then from Nigel. Well, basically, I think it's been a very useful debate. Uh, I think that uh, I'm fascinated by Peter's uh, assessment of the position. Um, I don't think it was that far away from what I really passionately feel myself as a practicing politician. Uh, we have to be able to do things that are really going to change our relationship with the European Union. Uh, I take in good heart and with a bit of fun uh, Nigel's parky remarks about the Maastricht vote, but it was a reality at the time. Uh, we could not, we could not have brought that government down without the Jim the, the Smith and Co taking over, and it was really as bad as that. And I said in my speech. I said, I am not going to hand over the running of this country to you who are more federal even than my own prime minister. That's what would have happened and it would have been a disaster. However, I'll leave that aside. 
it's been a good debate. There are real issues. There is a certain amount in common between the two parties. But on the fundamental question of whether or not we can achieve our objectives, it is only the Conservative Party, which, if it has enough members in, of Parliament, will be able to guarantee that we make the changes that are needed. Nigel. Bill, Peter, I would just say, chaps, you know, I, I, I read and listen to what you have to say. I've got great respect for what you've done uh, in the cause of Conservative politics. I think you're both out of touch, behind time. You haven't recognised there's a big change taking place in British politics. There is a big change. Much bigger than you think. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your really fascinating questions. And will you join me in thanking our outstanding speakers that we've had here today. And can I, can I also ask you to make a contribution as you leave to help the Bruges Group carry on their good work. There's some buckets at the back.